Evercreech Junction, Somerset. It was to be the Clapham Junction of the West, the place where one line branched away to Bath and collared the Midland trade, and the main line ran to Highbridge and collared the coal from Cardiff. In 1963, John Betjeman, that keen observer of the English scene, turned his poet's eye on a vanishing piece of West Country life. That Pickwickian figure in the frightful hat is, I'm sorry to say, me talking to the station master. And here comes the 1232 from Sturminster Newton on her way to Bath, calling at Evercreech Junction, change for Glastonbury, Shatwick and stations to Highbridge. The independent Somerset and Dorset Joint Railway, known to its many friends as simply the S&D, linked Bath and Bournemouth. There was a branch from Evercreech Junction to Burnham-on-Sea with twigs to Wells and Bridgewater. But it ran slap through the territory of the mighty Great Western Railway and was never forgiven for trespassing. The S&D closed in 1966 and has almost vanished off the face of the earth, but its spirit is preserved here on the West Somerset Railway. Among the volunteer workforce is former S and D driver Rodney Scoville. I quite enjoy coming down here with these lads, you know. He's joined by another old friend and colleague, driver Bill Rawls. Uh, with the S and D, you know, it's one a little bit different other railways, Bill. One, it's sort of like you knew everybody, yeah, one, yeah. you know, and uh, the thing where some you say. How's your beans growing? Oh, I don't know. They ain't doing all good this year. Well, I don't know. I, I, mine's doing all right. And uh, I offer sprout plants. I'll bring out a few, you know. Well, you can sell you like yourself, won't you? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I used to take eggs myself. Got my own little sidelines, ah, you know. Yeah, sort of yeah, keep, yeah, uh, keep yeah, the wheels yeah, turning, yeah. you know. Yeah. Always keep so, the signalman happy. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll keep saying, I'll keep, keep, keep the kettle boiling. Well. Yeah, keep the kettle boiling yeah, 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 everywhere, yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, keep the kettle boiling. Well, you always had a, seemed to always have a good mate, didn't you? I suppose we look back at a happy time more than us others, but looking mm. back over the years, I suppose it was a very happy time yeah. all along. You knew everybody, you knew exactly what each one was going right. to do, That's you knew right. the way they were going to work, how they were going to do the job. That was the difference in our railway and the other railways, wasn't it? You know, the more we look around, the more you actually find the, the old days, Rod. This yeah. is the base of the, the footbridge. Which of the footbridge used to be used to go right up over the top. Yeah. Right yeah. The, to the, uh, At Evercreech, Rod Scoville and rail enthusiast Mike Arlett uh, set out to retrace the line to Burnham on Sea. The old signal uh, post used to be there. Seeing Evercreech as it is today, I sometimes think to myself, did it really happen? You begin to wonder, was it all a dream? Was there ever a railway there? I think, in general, right up to the closure of the line, the real feeling of most of the men I knew and the people who worked on the line, that it wasn't going to happen. It had been there since they could remember, their fathers and grandfathers can remember, and it just wasn't going to happen. Some miracle was going to be pulled out of the hat that the line would always be there. But uh, March 1966, the line really did close and it was the end of an era and the end of a way of life. Its last days were recorded by the TV cameras, still in black and white in 1966, but it was all happening in colour. Thanks to a few enthusiasts who used colour film, it's still possible to see the line as it really was. In the early 60s, Ivo Peters of Bath decided to record the line he loved before it was too late. His film survives as a vivid reminder of the steam age, a generation after the last train passed this way. When steam was king, even the motorist gave way to its stately progress through the countryside. Oh yes, the level crossing used to cause some consternation to the traffic, especially as the years went by and traffic built up. It was nothing for the motors to get very irate about having to wait so long. And uh, of course in those days, rail traffic seemed to take much more of a precedent over road traffic than it does today. As we say goodbye to the station master, please notice that on expenses 
I'm travelling first. Back in 1963, John Betjeman had the answer to traffic jams. Forget motor cars. Get rid of anxiety. And here, to the rhythm of the Somerset and Dorset Joint Railway. Dream again that ambitious Victorian dream which caused this long railway still to be running through deepest, quietest, flattest, remotest, least spoiled Somerset. Before Dr Beeching swept it all away, the branch line to Burnham was a friendly railway run by friendly railwaymen, like signalman Frank Jones and driver Ronald Andrews. Oh, it was marvellous. Under marvellous. That's what I noticed about it first of all, you know. Having been at Bristol, where drivers more or less sailed through, you know, and, and you didn't know them from anyone else, we had a wonderful spirit. We did. And, and it carried on right until I left. Yes. I started on the railway in 1932 at Bristol. My father was an express driver on the LMS at Bristol, and uh, my brother was a fireman, and it seemed logical to me to follow in their footsteps. But uh, when I got off the train at Basin Bridge, I thought to myself, where have I come to? <laughs> Just one platform and a few cows in the field, you know? Uh, that's right. But Charlie came along, and, and he took all of my bag, and he said, come on, my son, you'll be all right. After I'd been there a few weeks, all the drivers spoke to you and knew their name, you know. That's true. And uh, you'd get off and have a yarn with them. And, ah. and it was marvelous. The guards and all, they, they, they were, oh, it was a fraternal sort of a, a, a atmosphere, wasn't it? Very happy. I was, to tell you the truth, I used to like to go up there again now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I used to love to. For drivers like Ronald Andrews, passenger safety was all important. It involved constant vigilance by the extended family of S&D staff. People like the level crossing keepers in their isolated cottages, a vital part of the railway service that went unnoticed by the travelling public, a fleeting glimpse from the carriage window. And now, just one more forgotten statistic in Dr Beeching's report. Very remote here, isn't it? Yeah, it was, it's surprising, really, how well, people used to live out in these yeah. remote places. But uh, they had all their little occupations, and they used to pass the time when the trains weren't about. These gates were, well, they open and closed by hand rather than by mechanism, were they? They were open and closed by hand, and there was a lady crossing keeper here, and she used to operate the gates. How were they operating? Rod Scoville and Mike Arlett made their way to the lonely cottage at Cockmill Crossing. This used to be the signal frame. And oh, I see. What, out in the open? She used to do that in between catching rabbits and cutting a few bean sticks and pea sticks. If you didn't mind the isolation, it could have been a very pleasant way of life. Always to go by, touch a whistle, and it's a friendly way from the crossing keeper. The crossing people were a very, very hardy and a very, very cheerful lot. Seldom you ever heard them complain. West Pennard Station, built of the local limestone. Well, I suppose this is the final irony, isn't it? Road really has taken over. Yes, uh, yeah, that's it. But the station itself, all it needs is a lick of paint, and it could be, you know, a station again, but I don't think you'll ever see another train. One of the stranger daily rituals to be seen on the branch involved the train crew handling undersized milk churns full of drinking water. Other refreshments could also be found if you knew where to look. There was a lot of cider made at West Pennard. The platform used to be loaded with barrels of cider going all over the place. And, of course, well, they was loaded up the cider, of course, there was always a jar for, for, the, <laughs> for the driver and fireman and the guard. Yeah. <laughs> and it was good cider. The water, however, was for the crossing keepers and their families, most of whom had no main supply. The daily delivery on the morning goods train was still a part of life on the branch, even in the swinging 60s of the Beatles and the miniskirt. And Ivo Peters was able to film scenes that hadn't changed in a hundred years. 
the cans used to go on the front of the engine, of course we weren't doing any great speed, and uh, we had to stop at the crossing, and uh, the crossing keeper used to come out, take off the full water cans, and they take, put the empty ones on, which went on to the next station down to be refilled for the next trip. People used to look forward to it, and we used to take papers, and sometimes people asked us to take the, their groceries along. Mm. They was looking forward. It was a, it was a lifeline. There was always a cup of tea. And even the people that wanted to do a shop in, in Ibridge, they used to come in on the engine and go to Bridgewater, come to Ibridge and do the shopping. That was the only way they could do it. There's no other way. There was no other way at all. Oh, by the way, there's Glaston Tor. And how nice to see it without a foreground of villas and petrol stations. Coming into Glastonbury, obviously the landmark was the Tor, which is on the left-hand side of the track going towards Glastonbury. And uh, it's a very quite impressive station for um, a branch line and with the overbridge and, of course, the three platforms. And now it's just a flat piece of land. Glastonbury Station. I suppose the promoters of the Somerset and Dorset hoped that this place was going to become a vast industrial town. As the train, when it stops, waits here for two minutes, I always like to get out and have a look. There's always something to see in a railway station. Let's have a look at the waiting room. Gaslight, solid furniture, Georgian tradition carried on into Victorian times. Glastonbury used to hold quite a lot of freight wagons. Uh, coal used to come in. Most of the traffic from Clark's, Sun and Moreland's, the uh, shoe people and the leather work people used to all go by rail. And it was not until the end of the 50s and the uh, early part of the 60s that traffic was taken off and went by road. And then, of course, we had the ticket box there and the soydens over there. And coming along here over to this side. And... Seeing Glastonbury now, it is very, very much a scene of dilapidation and neglect. It's hard to believe that uh, a lot of trains used to run in there and we used to be there shunting. But it was the loss of the passenger service that really upset the locals. Among them, Ron Wakefield of Glastonbury. I read in the paper that they were thinking of closing the line. So I thought, I've got a camera. I'll see if I can get some shots of it before it goes. Because I knew it was going to be some historical interest in years to come. And uh, that's how I started on it. I had the camera and a bicycle. And uh, off we went. When I started the film, and then I got the wife and daughter to come down off of the footbridge and walk up to the train and, and get in. That's what started it all off, really. We didn't have a car, and uh, we had a little family. And it was all, always made so easy for you. I traveled mostly to Wells from Glastonbury every Saturday. And if I weren't there in time, the train would hold up for me, or I'd even known it to stop for me to go across. Uh, that was the service you got. And then when I got there with the pram with the children, and they'd just lift the pram up into the goods van and I'd go up with it, you know, not to disturb the children. We didn't have much money, so everything seemed expensive, but it was the cheapest form of travel. 
So you can imagine how we missed it when it was closed down. It was really like an old friend going. When we heard about it, we worried about it, and, and my husband thought, well, that would be a good idea to film it. We should have something to look back on. I say, I hope you're enjoying this journey as much as I am. You really see much more country once you've got out of the railway station from a train than ever you do from a motor car. You really felt you were fitting into the landscape because you were gliding through and uh, you had this lovely noise, you know, when you were going in on the train, that noise that the steam train makes that we all loved, you know. This is Sedgemoor. No hoardings, no road signs, no lorries in front of you, and no neurotics hooting behind you. There was one irritation, however. The reams or rivers had a habit of bursting their banks. Yes, I can remember when this used to get flooded, and I'd come up with a train one time, and uh, we got along here so far, and the floods are up. And we just went through them, right up to the wheels. Had to shut the damper down to keep the fire from blowing back up onto the cab. But we never stopped. Kept going? Kept, yeah, that's the railway days, you kept going. Sedgemoor is dominated by Glastonbury Tor, the focus of mystery and legend. A symbolic presence rising up out of the flat expanse of peat moorland that stretches to the sea. Trip. You'd go through all these small stations like Ashgate, Leightonbridge and all those, and the people was always there to wave to you, the peat workers and different ones, you know, that um, we got so much fun out of the actual travelling as well as when we got there. We were always glued to the window to watch every little thing as we were passing by, you know. Plenty of wildlife where there weren't people working. Of course, there's men and women working there on the peat, and of course, they always got a huge laugh from us all, you know, waving to us. And then uh, you see all the withies growing, and you can see the pleasure we reap from it. Of course, you had um, the reins running along each side of the track, and um, it was really speaking quite pleasant to go across there with a train. Springtime was a, was a glorious time along the branch. To see the primroses growing on the bank and the various trees bursting into bud, it really was a wonderful sight. And if the engine wasn't too noisy, the different sounds of the birds and the different sounds of the countryside. But these rural charms were lost on the railway management. They saw only rising costs, falling traffic, and a government that preferred road haulage. Closures were bound to come. The only question was which lines should go. The Great Western successor, Western Region, was about to settle an old score. Meanwhile, other sounds disturbed the peace of Sedgemoor. Go away, you brute. You enemy of railways and comfortable travel. You know, I'm not just being nostalgic and sentimental and unpractical about railways. Railways are bound to be used again. They are not a thing of the past. And it's heartbreaking to see them left to rot and to see the fine men who serve them all their lives made uncertain about their own futures and about their jobs. They allocated the whole of the Somerset and Dorset to the Western region. And from that time on, traffic that was formerly run over the Somerset and Dorset was being diverted over the western and we didn't get the traffic at all. I could see that it was being deliberately done. A lot of railmen that had spent their life on the railway were very, very bitter. Let's face it, they'd given their best and they'd worked hard for very little money, really. Here's Highbridge, 
the end of the passenger line of the Somerset and Dorset. So I suppose I'd better get out. Tybridge was uh, mostly concerned with the parcels traffic that used to come in on the trains from Glastonbury. Every parcel bag was uh, full up with uh, Clark shoes, wasn't it? Yes. The trains, such as we had the passenger trains, connected at Highbridge with the western trains, didn't they? Yes, yes. But it seemed as soon as the western region got operating in charge of it, the, the trains were altered just that little bit and people found themselves arriving at Highbridge on the western main line and they had perhaps two or three hours to wait for one of our trains up well, the branch. Years know? ago, like you said, Frank, no, they, they used to wait for trains off. I did, the I did. That, and right. we used to wait for western trains yeah, that's that's right. going to Bournemouth that's right. and that's right. different places like that. Highbridge is a piece of railway history. It's also a railway contrast. But come and see the older station. There it is, with a diesel hurrying through it to the west, to Bridgewater and Exeter. One of Brunel's original stations, with the broad eaves and the cut stone for the doorways and the windows. But now, cross over the bridge and come and see the slightly younger station. Yes, it's somewhat different in the way of trains than what I used to remember as a boy with the kings and the castles and the whole running through here. Not quite the same, these, are they? No, no, no. But at least there's still one at station At least there's still the station's open yeah. and, it's been, and it's functional, yeah. yeah. And quite a contrast, really, to what it used to be, and an even bigger contrast when we start looking across well, here to where the old S&D station used to be. The S&D station there, well, uh, seven platforms, as far as I can recollect, and uh, used to be quite busy. Uh, you know, through, throughout the year. Yeah. yeah nothing yeah. left there but empty ground. Yeah. And then over on this side, yeah, what do we have over here? Yeah, over on this side there, the line used to run in a diagonal across there. The uh, hybrid Great Western box used to be right here in front of us. And um, the line used to cross, intersect across between the tracks there. Yeah, well, and go under the bridge. Under the bridge, uh, through, through, and through, through the bridge. And that was the route running through Highbridge Great Western Station. And there, right across that important main line, runs the little branch to Highbridge Wharf and Burnham on Sea of the Somerset and Dorset Joint. The line is used for goods only now, and we'll follow the goods train through the town of Highbridge to its lonely end come to Highbridge Wharf. There it is. The place the Somerset and Dorset hoped to establish as an enormous port. The hope was partly realised. That's what it's like now. Highbridge Wharf, your hopes have died. They flow like driftwood down the tide, out, out into the open sea, O oh, sad, forgotten S and D. When John Betsman came down here, and we stopped at every station, and John Betsman used to get out and have a chat with the station staff, until we eventually come to Burnham. I couldn't get into the waiting rooms and the booking hall because they were locked. But the Southern Railway renamed the place Burnham-on-Sea in a hope to attract railway traffic. It was so special because it was our one trip to Burnham each year with the Sunday school treats. 
all the way down. We had this sense of being very excited. You were overwhelmed with it all because it was the only mode of travel that we experienced in those days, barring a bicycle. And uh, when we got near the seaside, as we say, we did open down the windows just to smell, the smell of the sea, and we were getting near and that sort of thing. And, and uh, the seagulls flying overhead, and so they were welcoming us as well, you know. I remember when he got out at Burnham, he shook hands and said cheerio, <laughs> and he went up on the seafront, he jumped the boat, made a bit of a dance, he said, air light wine. <laughs> Air like wine, yes. It's a beautiful seaside place. And the air on the sands and on the pier is like wine. But the days of Burnham as a railway destination would soon be over. The wind of change was blowing and there would be no more Sunday school treats. A rapid decline began as the beaching report took effect. Morale collapsed and closure, when it came three years after John Betjeman's visit, was almost a relief. Nobody seemed to care anymore. Yes, when the scrap merchants came in, they more or less had a free hand. And yeah, had the lot. They were all burnt up. And uh, it seemed to railmen that the question was to get it up as quick as you can before you somebody finish. says leave it and we'll open it up again. Uh, all yeah. done quick. Sleepers yeah. and all. In decent haste, you know. Uh, What's more, it's wrong in every way. When we all of us know that road traffic is becoming increasingly hellish on this overcrowded island, and that in 10 years from now, there'll be three times as much traffic on English roads as there is today. What will the West Country be like then? How will we get anywhere in summer, except by railway? How will we see any country, except from a train? I think it's more than likely that we'll deeply regret the branch lines we've torn up and the lines that we've let to go to rot. Today, the M5 motorway blocks the track bed of this railway, and exit 22 is now the junction for Burnham. Burnham-on-Sea. The Somerset and Dorset Railway brought you prosperity a century ago. Burnham-on-Sea in 10 years' time, when the roads are so full of traffic, we'll all be going by train again. You'll be grateful you still have a railway to your town. Don't let Dr. Beeching take it away from you. Going of that train was a real heartache. It really was to us people that had no car and not much money. It was really like losing a good friend. 